What's going on, Meat Mafia? Welcome back to another episode of the Meat Mafia podcast. Before we get rolling here today, we want to give a quick shout out to you, the listener. We are so thankful to have you on board with the Meat Mafia, and we cannot thank you enough for your endless support. Without you guys, we are nothing. So thank you so much for your comments, feedback, likes, subscribes, listens, everything. It means the world to us. With that being said, please go to your podcast medium's platform. Give us a five-star review. If it's not five stars, maybe don't give us a review. Subscribe. um, Do the whole thing. We really appreciate that. And also, please go check out some of the links below. We have some great sponsors and they are killing it in the world of food and providing great high-quality food for people just like yourself. Quickly, outlining our sponsors, we have Holy Cow Beef, Rick Ranches, Equip Foods, and The Carnivore Bar. These are all great products. If you wanna learn more, go check out the links below. Without further ado, here's a word from our sponsors. This episode of the podcast is brought to you by Equip Foods. Equip provides a complete source of grass-fed beef protein with no added chemicals, fillers, binding agents, or artificial coloring or sweeteners. If you're familiar with the supplement industry, you know that most supplements are loaded with ingredients that you can't even pronounce. Equip's unflavored prime has one single ingredient derived directly from grass-fed beef protein. For purists like ourselves who try to only consume balanced, real sources of nutrition, this protein powder checks all the boxes. Go check them out in the link below and use our promo code in the description to get a discount. Holy Cow Beef is a regenerative farm based out of Lubbock, Texas with humanely raised grass-fed, grass-finished beef available for sale and shipment. Companies like ButcherBox source from outside of the US and Australia and don't specifically have the American Grass-Fed Association or AGA label, but Holy Cow does. They also sell chicken and pork in addition to their amazingly high quality beef raised right here in Texas. Ann and Warren Weldon have overcome their own health struggles and they have inspired us through the way that they choose to live their lives and the way they raise their animals. So please support them and go check out their website in the link below. Also, if you're in Colorado, go check out Rick Ranches, a grass-fed, grass-finished, regenerative farm servicing all over Colorado. He also accepts Bitcoin, so all you Bitcoiners out there, go hit up Rick Ranches and get your beef today. This episode of the podcast is brought to you by The Carnivore Bar. The Carnivore Bar is an animal-based, shelf-stable product with only three simple ingredients, beef, tallow, and salt. The bar is inspired by the ancient traditions of Native Americans who needed to create pemmican bars to preserve meat for long distance travel. The carnivore bar is perfect for animal based athletes or busy people looking to follow a low carb diet. It's easy to throw in a bag and take with you anywhere you're going, whether it's a workout, hike, or even packing it for a snack at work. I throw them in my triathlon bag and take down a bar immediately after working out. They're a fantastic product, so go check them out and use our discount code in the link below. Odell, what's going on, brother? Welcome to the Meat Mafia podcast. What a boys, pleasure to be here. Dude, we're uh, we're pumped to have you on. And like we said, we had on Echo last week, Jimmy Song, Parker Lewis, Breed Love. So we're just keeping that Bitcoin streak flowing. So we couldn't think of anyone better to have on than you to keep it going. Love it. Well, it's absolutely my pleasure. Like I said, uh, got to meet you guys in Colorado. And uh, yeah, I just, I love kicking it with you guys. <laughs> well, maybe that's a good place to start because... Colorado was one of those things where if you weren't there, you probably didn't appreciate it nearly as much as the people who showed up and um, were in Crawford talking about Bitcoin, talking about ranching and the effects that Bitcoin could have on the food system. And um, I'm like, I'm just genuinely curious, like what brought all those people there? It was such a unique event. So what motivated you to go from Nashville to Colorado and and get out there and start talking about Bitcoin to what was a small community of ranchers and Bitcoiners and all sorts of people. Um, but I mean, I didn't just like, I didn't even just fly out there. I drove, I, my lady got in the car, our two dogs got in the car. We drove 22 hours, we drove 22 hours from Nashville (laughs) uh, to Crawford. Um, you know, food has always been important to me. And my lady, when we first started dating was massively into, regenerative agriculture and sustainable practices um, and knowing where your food's coming from. But we were kind of, uh, you know, 
we appreciated it, but we were just like, you know, we'd get white oak farms or white oak pastures, or I think she had like two other two other uh, farms that did direct to consumer and they would just ship it to us and we would eat it, right? Like it'd mm -hmm. be in the freezer. We were not like actively involved in it. Um, obviously my main focus has been Bitcoin over those years. Um, and then, and I had in the back of my mind that we always wanted land and, you know, we wanted to do some basic farming ourselves, right? Um, maybe some goats, some cows, some chickens, um, very basic, but sustainable, try and like live off the land. Um, and that's still our goal. I always joke around like if Bitcoin's successful or if Bitcoin's not successful, we're still going to be in a cabin in the woods. But <laughs> the question is like, how much land do we have? Is really mm -hmm. what it comes down to. Um, and I never knew like what my entry point was going to be. Like, how could I convince a rancher to teach me his skills when I have no skills? Mm -hmm. And I never really had anything to bring to the table. And then Texas Slim just like dropped in my lap and he was like, Matt, I need your help. And I'm just thinking in the back of my head, I was like, damn, I need your help. And I'm like, yes. so it's really, <laughs> and we always talk about value for value. Like that's the ultimate value for value, like hard skills for hard skills. Um, and as soon as Slim reached out, like we were all in, like, I, I like to think I'm a good negotiator, but with Slim, I wasn't, I was just, I was like, anything you need, I am here. Mm -hmm. uh, he's like, we're doing this great event in Georgia. I was like, I, I can't make it. I have a wedding conflict. Um, he's like, oh, well, that's only like three hours from where you live, but there's another event I'm doing that's 22 hours away from where you live. Why don't you come to that event instead? I was like, well, we wouldn't miss it. So then we just jumped in the car and we headed over there. And I will say like, I am, I thought I was completely bought in on just the call, but just being at the event, it was so special. I mean, Bitcoin mm -hmm. was a very minor part of the event. Um, and we talked about so many different important things. We talked about food. We talked about raising your children, talked about education and we mm -hmm. talked about Bitcoin and it just, it felt, it felt more like, uh, it felt more like a wedding than a conference. It felt more like a family reunion Totally. People that I didn't even know. Right. That, but I was like meeting them for the first time, maybe like cousins, long lost cousins that I hadn't, I hadn't met. Um, and it was just super special. Totally. What do you think it was about the event in particular that was so special to you? And the reason why I'm asking you that is Harry and I have spent a lot of time just questioning, like, how can you form such strong relationships with people that you don't even know in three days? And like, the only words that we've been using to describe that weekend are just like either magical or special. And everyone else that's been in attendance has described the events in a similar fashion. So just curious for you, what do you think made it so special over those three days? But that's why I keep going back to wedding. And I mean, I personally told, uh, you know, not to to my own horn that much, but I personally like said to Slim, like to change the name from conference to summit. Cause I think conference kind of uh, doesn't do it justice for mm. what it is. And the reason I keep going back to wedding is because I think a lot of people have this experience where they, if they go to a wedding, you know, it's their close friend's wedding or something. And then they meet people at that wedding that are close friends with their close friend. Right. Yes. And they, they, you develop a very strong bond with them. But a lot of times what happens is then you fall out of touch. Right. Now, imagine a scenario where there's weddings all over the country with like, the same people or like a combination of the same people, different mixes of the same people over and over again. And those relationships keep compounding and getting stronger and stronger. Um, and that's kind of where I feel like this sits, where yeah. you're, you're really you're, you're making bonds for a lifetime. And then where the beef initiative comes in and, and when I try and distill what the beef initiative is, because I, I don't like when people aren't concise, is, is it's ultimately a, a coordination movement. You have all these like minded people around the world. They know kind of the right direction of what needs to happen, but they don't have the coordination. They don't have they, they don't have the, the people they can rely on, they, they can trust and they can work with. And, and Beef Initiative kind of just fills that gap and pulls everyone together. It's funny that it, it kind of just brings like the virtual money into the real life realm of like, if this money's going to work, you need to know that there's other people on the other side of the coin, so to speak, to bestow the same level of value that you hold in this digital asset, right? Like the network effect is a legitimate thing. And so like having these real life in-person events, there is some, there's value to that, I think. I mean, there's massive value. There's in-person, 
in-person connection, interpersonal connection, like looking people in the eyes, shaking their hand, shake your rancher's hand, right? Yeah. Uh, there, it's so it's irreplaceable. You cannot replace that. Um, it, and and that that's where the real connections happen. That's where the real conversations happen. And that's where these movements really get off the ground. And and what I say a lot about Bitcoin, and I think it's very similar to um, this this you know this food intelligence movement, is that we're we're creating tools and education that empower individuals. But mm -hmm. that only gets you so far. Ultimately, what you need is you need those empowered individuals to then coordinate and work together. And that's when these movements really start to gain ground and actually get some real change going. Mm -hmm. To your point, Odell, a question that we ask ourselves a lot is like, where does this convergence of Bitcoin, carnivory, decentralized food, ranching, where does that come from? And I'm just curious what your answer would be there if you've spent any time thinking about that, because I'm sure you have. It's 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 empowering individuals. Um, that's why that's why the children raising children fits in, right? Because yes historically raising your children has had all these top down you know state state forced things or community forced things where you don't really have that much control over raising your children uh food has obviously been heavily heavily impacted in that way money has been heavily impacted that way and i would say you know uh the firearms have as well right guns have as well um and so that's why you see the confluence of of the 3d printed gun movement mm -hmm. You see food, you see money in Bitcoin, you see raising your children. It's all kind of interconnected and you really can't succeed at being uh, more personally responsible, more sovereign without a combination of all of them. If you, if you have a lack of one of them, you know, you're, you're kind of back where you started. Mm. Maybe we could take a step back and get some context around your Bitcoin story, kind of how you got into it. Because before the show, we were talking about all the stuff you're doing. It's it's honestly amazing, like from teaching people about hardware wallets, Bitcoin mining, the live events, in-person events that you're hosting, you're doing a ton. But what kind of got you so involved in Bitcoin and, and inspired by Bitcoin? Well, like, so I grew up in, into, like, I was becoming a man in, in 2008 when everything went to shit. Mm. Um, and that was like, kind of like the first sign to me that like all the experts, all the people that pretend they know what they're talking about, just like have no clue. Right. So that was like the mm. first piece of the puzzle that just like, you know, everyone's pretending they know what they're talking about. Um, but really we're just in uncharted waters and no one really has any idea what's going on. Um, and then 2013, so 2012, I found out about Bitcoin from um, a friend that unfortunately had a drug problem and was buying drugs off a of Silk Road. Uh, I didn't trust his judgment at all. I completely disregarded him. Then later in 2012, I had a straight edge friend who was a programmer who told me about Bitcoin. Uh, he was straight edge because he's Muslim. Uh, so no alcohol, no drugs, complete nerd. And I was like, holy shit, like, how does this guy and, and the, my, my drug using friend, like, how do they both, you know, come to the same conclusion on this money? Um, but then I still kind of disregarded it. In 2013, the Snowden docs leaked. And at that point, I was uh, relatively trusting of our tech establishment, relatively trusting of these large, these large corporations, the Apples and the Googles and the Microsofts. And I realized they were all basically an extension of the state and that corporate surveillance and government surveillance is all in one. It's all, it's all, it can all be treated as one basically at this point, And we couldn't rely on them anymore. And that's as I was getting into Bitcoin. So then it was Bitcoin plus the greater open source movement is our only real possibility of digital sovereignty. Um, and then I guess, you know, my dad has always, uh, harped on me or taught me as, as a kid that you, you shouldn't, you shouldn't focus your life on things that you don't understand. So then I spent pretty much, I spent the last nine years trying to break Bitcoin apart in my head and see where it fails. And as I went down that rabbit hole, I got more and more conviction and realized, damn, this thing might actually work. and. Uh, this could be the tool that we really need to to break free, at least on the money side. Mm -hmm. 
what were some of those core principles of Bitcoin, Odell, that made you realize that it was going to withhold against the stress test that you had on it? And this really was something differentiated to all the other types of crypto that exist. Well, when I got into Bitcoin, there was no, like the shit coins were just barely getting started, right? Like Ethereum was, is really like the king shit coin uh, that really set the mold for like what a VC corporate shit coin would look like. And like that, I don't think really launched until 2015, 2016. Um, so I actually like, I watched the birth of shit coins. And that was that a very <laughs> special experience. You kind of had it. Um, I, it was kind of infuriating because I mean, I, I, I pretty much immediately when I saw the Ethereum launch, I was like, this thing is not going to work long term. Like the priorities are not correct. Mm. Uh, but I didn't like, I mean, there was a period there where, where Ethereum gains were just insane. Like I could be retired right now if I just, you know, bought a little and sold it at the top. Right. But everyone always says that oh, I like bought a little sold at the top. Um, but there was like points where I was like, am I the crazy one? Um, so like my whole Bitcoin journey has really been about testing my knowledge, improving my knowledge, and then building conviction off of that. Um, like the conviction doesn't come out of nowhere. Like this whole idea, like I'm, I'm a big proponent of, you know, s slow, steady accumulation of Bitcoin long-term as savings. Yeah. Uh, I, I, my, I, my motto is stay humble, stack sats uh, in that regard. Like that didn't come naturally. Like I got wrecked trading. <laughs> like I got wrecked trading. I was like, damn, I'm not a good trader. Like I can't do that. And I learned that, you know, the, the best practice here is, is slow and steady accumulation. Yeah. Um, when it comes to proper storage of Bitcoin, you know, mm. it didn't start that way. Got wrecked using shitty, shitty wallets. And I, I, I realized, you know, there's, I improved my own setup. And then I realized, you know, there isn't that much education out there that is, that is helping people. Like most of the education is leading them to, to either scams or insecure wallets or insecure tools. And, and so then I started getting into like the education space. Um, so like everything has just been testing my thesis and 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 building conviction off of it and then trying to find uh trying to find unfilled niches within that this movement that i could fill because i personally do not believe in you know time is the most scarce thing and i don't mm -hmm. believe in wasting your time doing something that other people are already doing if they're doing it well i'd rather just use their tool or service right mm -hmm. have you put that thought pattern of I'm the crazy one fully to bed or does that ever does that ever pop up uh here and there I will the peak crazy was 2017 <laughs> 2017 there was about a seven month period where I was like maybe I'm wrong uh I held the line and it worked out um but the ICO craze when everything was going absolutely crazy and I was like you can just safely ignore that. And I was telling like friends and family, you can just safely ignore that. And they were watching all these bullshit ICOs go up like 2000% VCs and, and people that were, you know, respected in their various fields saying, this is the future. And I just kind of looked like an idiot to all those people. Um, that was probably peak crazy uh, where I thought I was, you know, maybe I, I, I missed the plot, you know, missed the boat, not missed the boat. I was, I lost the plot. Yeah. Um, but then, I mean, after that collapse, I was, my conviction was very strong. And then 2020 with, you know, the whole COVID and then the response to COVID, uh, I, you know, I'm pretty sure that uh, I, have, I have a lot, I have a lot more conviction. I'm humble enough not to say like everyone else is crazy. Like, I'm not going to say that on air, um, but I'm, I'm pretty sure that there's a small subset of us that are, are seeing seeing through all the bullshit and yeah. kind of get at least the general direction where this is all going. And the overwhelming majority of people are just really content and ignorant and oblivious to everything that's going on. And like my bull case is kind of, I call it optimistic, but it's kind of pessimistic mm -hmm. is that people are just going to have to get burned. Like all these things are just going to get worse and worse and they're going to get burned. Friends and family are going to get burned and they're going to learn. And then at that point, what we need to do is we need to have the education. We need to have the tools there so that when they realize that need, they can empower themselves. Hmm. When we think about things from an educational standpoint, what are the, some of the biggest misconceptions that you see with the general public around Bitcoin? 
Well, the one of the biggest ones is uh, conflation with all of the altcoins and NFTs and everything else. And it's hard to blame them, right? Because it does get lopped in together as crypto. And this is why you see a lot of Bitcoiners lash out at altcoiners um, because because it, it does make our job more difficult when we're explaining it to friends and family. You have to kind of set up the base, you know, before you even start talking about this stuff. Um, besides that, you know, the number one thing everyone always says is, you know, the 21 million cap is going to get increased. Mm -hmm. Um, and the thing about that is personally, like, I just don't think people respect that it takes time. It takes time for them to sit there and think about it and watch as it doesn't get increased. Um, people think Bitcoin can get hacked really easily. Same thing. It's just like you get a first touch, you see it first, and then over time you start to realize like, oh no, this thing is actually really resilient. Like ultimately Bitcoin is this weird, you know, it's a network not controlled by any individual corporation or government. Uh, we don't, our brains can't really fathom that, right? Uh, so, but ultimately what that means is that there's essentially this massive bug bounty out for this global financial network. So if someone can hack it or fuck it up, they can make a lot of money. So the longer that doesn't happen, the easier it is to point to this being a stable, robust system. Because if you're not a programmer, if it, it's just really hard. It's, we've never seen anything like this really before. So it's really hard to wrap your head around it. And mostly it just takes time to, to get through those misconceptions. Mm. What um, what can people do to kind of orient themselves when it comes to the crypto craze? Like, because everyone's been, you were there earlier when there was no when there were no other cryptocurrencies out there, but now people have to orient themselves in a world where people are saying, oh, especially people who have a, are in a position to make money off of NFTs, different shit coins left and right. It's like they're getting told all these different stories from influencers that you, you know, you pop up Instagram and there's some idiot telling you to buy this, the next coin. It's like, how do they actually go about walking through that process and getting to the, the point that Bitcoin is the only one you should be focusing on? Fixing the money is the biggest problem here. Well, first of all, the first thing I always, I, I tell them that just straight up right in the beginning, sure. right? You know, focus on Bitcoin. Everything else is noise. Try and try and slowly and steadily accumulate Bitcoin over time. I think of it as long-term savings. Um, a big thing when I talk to activists, when I talk to ranchers, when I talk to NFL players, is you know our time is scarce. Uh, our money is broken. This idea that you have to have a financial advisor or train yourself to pick stocks and have a quote-unquote you know. Uh, diversified portfolio is absolutely batshit crazy. And we should be able to just live our life, focus on what's important and save Bitcoin over time. And that money should increase in purchasing power without us doing anything for it so mm -hmm. that we're able to live off of that in the future and pass it down to our kids, kids and our grandchildren. Um, most of that will just go right past people and they're still going to want to speculate on all this other stuff. So what I usually say is, this is pragmatic Matt coming out is I say, look, if you want to trade these things, if you want to speculate on these things, fine. Hold them in self-custody. Don't trust a third party. Make sure you're actually accumulating Bitcoin and you're stacking sats on the side long term. Make sure you have that Bitcoin stash that is constantly growing. And what I know will happen is over the next two to four years after they start doing that, they're going to get absolutely wrecked on all the stuff they speculate on, and then they will focus on Bitcoin only. So I just, at this point, it's just like, I, I, I know I'm like kind of just screaming at a wall when I say it. So I just don't even really, I give them that base and then I let them learn their lesson by getting burned if they, if they choose to, to speculate. I, as far as I'm concerned, this idea that altcoins are a threat to Bitcoin or NFTs are a threat to Bitcoin, they're not a threat to Bitcoin mm -hmm. as a network. They're a threat to the, the people who choose to speculate on them who will get wrecked. Like 99% of them will get wrecked. You might make money if you, top, you buy the bottom, buy, sell the top for Bitcoin. Um, but 99% of people are going to get wrecked. That's who it's a threat to, not to the actual Bitcoin network. Mm. Yeah, your point around diversification and financial advisors and hiring people to manage your money, that was really interesting to me because I remember when I first started going down the Bitcoin rabbit hole, 
in 2020, when Harry was sending me some podcasts to listen to and resources, I remember just being blown away at some of these people that like they had sold off their 401k, they had sold off all these other financial instruments and only own Bitcoin. But then like, when I hear you speak and I hear more people in the space speak to it, I'm like, well, what's actually crazy is not owning Bitcoin. What's crazy is all this behavior that's been programmed into us by society, thinking that we need to diversify and hire financial advisors. And then you start to explain like what a sound currency actually looks like, and it should help mitigate the need for any of that. And I feel like that's so interesting. If you could just get the general public to realize that, um, it would be pretty powerful. The thing is they realize that, right? Like it's a massive mental burden. People are thinking about this all the time. Um, they just don't realize that there's an alternative out there. And one of the things when we talk about Bitcoin publicly, I think it's really important to, first of all, honestly disclose the trade-offs. But second of, second of all, you know, be clear and consistent with our messaging, right? And and a, a perfect example of this is, is when I talk about Bitcoin increasing in purchasing power, this is a long-term thing. Like I always, ex I expect Bitcoin to keep going through these, you know, hills and valleys along the way up in purchasing power so that in two years or whatnot, if Bitcoin's down from 60K to 20K, they're not losing their shit. Mm. And, you know, like you need to be consistent with that because this thing is a long time, long-term thing. And this knowledge is going to happen over time. And you don't want, if you actually care about the people who are getting into it, you don't want them to get washed out or burnt out or disenfranchised, disillusioned, right? You want them to come into it with the right framework to begin with. Yeah. it. I always, you said something earlier that sparked something for me, which is what does the world look like without Bitcoin? And it's like thinking through some of these, concepts around how big tech is really just an extension of go government and the amount of data and control that they have on essentially every industry out there is like un has been unchecked for so long bitcoin is this tool that like it it keeps the n of ones collectively safe if you just choose to opt in but it takes so much it, it takes so much time to get to the point where you're comfortable going all in on something uh, which I think is another burden for people. Like most people don't have that level of commitment in anything in their life. But that's why, you know, that's why I think, well, first of all, none of us, very few of us go all in in the beginning. Yeah. Right? Yeah. 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 <laughs> this is, this is why, this is why I stay humble and stack sats because it's not only so you don't get wrecked, but it's also because if you're just buying, if you're just taking, you know, 10% of your weekly salary and putting it into Bitcoin and you lose it, you just, you lost 10%. Like people spend more than that on cigarettes or Wendy's or some other bullshit. Yeah. Um, it's not that big of a deal. When I was first getting into Bitcoin, I quit cigarettes and I would just take, you know, cigarettes were already ridiculously expensive at that point. I would just take like the $10, $12 a day that I was putting into that and I would put it into Bitcoin instead. Mm. And then on a long enough time scale, it doesn't really matter how much what percent you allocate to Bitcoin. If our thesis is correct, it just ends up eating your whole net worth anyway. You just yeah. end up in a situation where you're 99% Bitcoin. Um, but I, I think once you go down that rabbit hole, it, there's like no looking back, like holding holding stocks or holding money in your bank account or trying to do wires or whatever. You just feel completely out of, you have no control. You have absolutely mm -hmm. no control over that. And Bitcoin just feels so much more real. Um, you, you feel so much more empowering than anything else that you can really hold. Mm -hmm. um, and that kind of that conviction kind of just grows itself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Yeah. Any, uh, Go ahead, Ari. Conversations in Crawford with any of the ranchers who were there around Bitcoin that stood out to you? Because Jason's already adopted Bitcoin in some way, but... I think he's very, he's like few and far between in terms of ranchers who are doing it. And I just, I view it as this ultimate tool for them to put the, rewrite the incentives back towards sound food, where our food system is completely fucked with reverse incentives. So I, I, yeah, I, I mean, a great opportunity to orange pill some of these ranchers. Yeah. I mean, Jason's already a ride or die Bitcoiner. He like yeah. lives Bitcoin. He breathes Bitcoin. Um, I actually had a really good conversation uh, with his son who was helping out with the event. Really great kid. Yes. Um, you know, I personally gave him some extra Bitcoin to play around with. 
Nice. Uh, I think he was very excited about it. The thing is, is ranchers are. So before I was working with ranchers, I did a lot. I've done a lot of work with activists and ranchers and activists are surprisingly similar in that. And it's, it's really a breath of fresh air after working with, you know, quite frankly, a lot of people that are in the United States, you know, we live in relative privilege are the systems pretty much work for us, you know, chase quick pay, Venmo, PayPal, you know, TD Ameritrade holding index funds or whatever the fuck. Uh, but with, with ranchers and activists, they already understand that there's a need. They've just, they've been getting their asses kicked for generations. Well, with ranchers for generations, uh, they know they need a better money. They just don't know if it exists and they don't know how to use it. So when you come in with Bitcoin, you don't, we don't have to, like, I don't have to explain why, why it's necessary. They, I just have to, I just have to explain why it could work and why I expect it to work and how they can use it. And then they take it from there. Like they, they were, uh, and that's part of what was so special and empowering about it. Right. Is that you just, you skip all that bullshit in the front where you're trying to whack away the privilege and you just, you just work with people that already understand the power of personal responsibility, already understand the power of, you know, picking yourself up off your own bootstraps and counting on yourself and your family and your community. Um, and you, you empower them with tools and education. Yes. And that's what was so powerful about your, one of the sessions that you led, which was on Sunday, which was the last day of the conference. And one of the things that we did was we said, Hey, Jason, Rick, you hosted this unbelievable event. Why don't we find a way to donate some funds to you in Bitcoin? And so there were a bunch of people that were local to Crawford, Colorado. There were a lot of ranchers that had never touched Bitcoin before, really were able to conceptualize it. And you taught everyone how to download a moon wallet and donate a few dollars or whatever they wanted to to Jason. And you literally saw the light bulbs go off because they actually saw how easy it is to transfer money. So I guess that kind of parlays into one of the questions that we had for you, Odell, was for someone that's listening to this and they're like, all right, I'm all in. I want to stay humble. I want to stack sats. What are some of like the practical tools or things that they should be thinking about downloading or implementing to be able to own Bitcoin? Well, first of all, what was really special about that exercise is we had the team at Ibex there, um, which is a Guatemala based uh, merch Bitcoin merchant processing company. And they they had five hundred dollars worth of Bitcoin to give away to everyone who didn't have Bitcoin. So they received their first Bitcoin. And the idea was, okay, we set them up on a mobile wallet. They receive this Bitcoin, and then they send the Bitcoin to Jason as a donation, right? Um, so if it was just the free Bitcoin, he should have only received five hundred dollars. There was clearly Bitcoiners in the crowd, including myself, because he received like fourteen hundred dollars with a donation. So it was just it was a really mm. special cap onto the whole weekend, and I felt like it was important to mention that. But the key to that demo to me is that as Bitcoiners, we get stuck and you guys do it too with, with, with meat and food. Like you get stuck going really deep. You know, it sounds really complicated. There's all these different things you go into, like the, the mental burden starts to add up. You're like, I got to focus on this. I got to be perfect. I got to do this. I got to do that. Oh, God forbid. Like I, you know, I'm at a friend's house and I accidentally eat something with seed oils in it. Like then all my work is done and I'm fucked. Um, yes. But ultimately, the cool part about Bitcoin to me is that it's simple, not that it's complicated, that it's mm -hmm. simple money, that it's something you can count on and rely on so you can focus on your life rather than focusing on, you know, holding and spending money like that should be the easiest aspect of our lives. Mm -hmm. And Bitcoin has never been easier to use than it is today because we have this dynamic ecosystem of interoperable wallets and services that all work with each other. And the easiest way for someone to use Bitcoin for the first time is on a mobile wallet because they already have their phone. You know, a lot of people have, you know, this extremely powerful computer in their pocket, connected to the internet, has a camera, has a screen, can send Bitcoin around the world or can send Bitcoin to a person right next to them. Um, so I expect most people to get in in the beginning using mobile wallets. Um, the mobile wallet we used there was a wallet called Moon to use M U U N. Um, based out of Argentina, extremely simple, easy wallet to use. It's on iPhone and Android. Um, and you're able to receive Bitcoin, send Bitcoin, and you're able to back it up so that if that company goes out of business, this is obviously something very unique to Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. uh, you're able to re recover that money, even if that company disappears tomorrow. Mm -hmm. uh, and the important thing to realize here and why I start with that 
is because you don't have to upload an ID. You don't have to give them an email address. You don't have to, you know, give them your, your, your mailing address, your billing address, a copy of your passport. You don't have to do any of that stuff. You literally just install the app and you're connected to a global financial network um, that you can use without permission. And that's the real power of Bitcoin. Now, when people buy Bitcoin, there's all these regulated services that connect to your bank and they add all this, this KYC and permission layer on top. And there's all these other complications that you really lose the, the true power of Bitcoin when you get exposed to it that first time. It won't click for you. Uh, and for a lot of people, it's a real shame. For a lot of people, you know, their friends will just hand them off and say like, oh, you know, off to the wolves with you. Go to Coinbase. And they go to Coinbase. They give them all of their personal information. Maybe they get denied. Uh, but let's say they even get it. At that point, they get it. Then they get hit with all these different altcoins mm -hmm. and all these different tokens that Coinbase wants to sell you. And then they they trust they trust that company with their money, something that they don't have mm -hmm. to do in, in Bitcoin. And it, sometimes it takes years for them to actually start using Bitcoin in a sovereign way. So personally, I think everyone's first touch should be sovereign Bitcoin wallet. Mm -hmm. And it's it's a little bit hard. And this kind of environment, you know, we're on we're on a podcast. You guys have a global audience. Um, it might not be easy for someone to do that, but I would say to the Bitcoiners that are listening, when you are onboarding friends and family, when you are trying to teach someone the power of Bitcoin, give them their first Bitcoin. Don't yeah. send them to a service, and it doesn't have to be that much money. You know, mm -hmm. give them ten to twenty dollars. Let them experience. Let them send it back to you. Let them use, you know, some some kind of service online where you have to pay with Bitcoin and see the actual power of it that you can do it. And that's the single most productive thing you can do if you're trying to introduce someone you care about to Bitcoin. Hmm. Are there platforms that you like for buying Bitcoin or um like I, I can think of one that I've used in the past, which is Swan Bitcoin. But are there other ones that you would recommend where you're not trusting? I think I still had to go through the KYC process with Swan. You did. But um, <laughs> is there are there other ways to accumulate other than just third party transactions? So the three big Bitcoin only ones are Strike, River, and Swan. Um, they all only offer Bitcoin. So you at least remove the altcoin distraction, all that stuff. And all three encourage you to not keep the Bitcoin on the platform. Now, unfortunately, all three of them default to you keeping the Bitcoin on the platform. I believe Swan, I'm not sure if River offers it, but Swan offers you the ability to set like an auto withdraw. So like it'll automatically send it, but that's like a setting that you have to enable. It's not the default. Um, all three require KYC information. KYC information is stands for know your customer. And that is essentially um, ID information. They, they want all they want your all your personal intimate information and they're going to hold that forever uh, yeah. because they're required to by law. They're going to share it with governments. They might share it with marketing firms. I don't think any of those three companies do, but they could. Uh, they might store it insecurely. It might get leaked. One thing we've learned is like pretty much any data that's held on the internet, you should assume it's going to get leaked eventually. It's going to get compromised eventually. Today, it came out that some Chinese company, they got exposed for 800 million face, face scans and license plates and wow. names and addresses, like complete compromise. We had uh, the Equifax hack in America where essentially every single adult uh, American got compromised. Um, so, so these compromises are going to happen and all of a sudden you're in a honeypot. Now, on top of that, people that are familiar with the American, uh, gun rights movement will know how, how strongly those proponents feel against lists of gun owners. Well, in Bitcoin land, I, I'm pretty sure I'm, I'm, I'm pretty vocal that we've been under attack for years now. And that is this 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 encroaching KYC, this this KYC creep that's just going to all these different services. And basically there's these ever growing lists of Bitcoiners and our transaction history. So there's a massive privacy risk and there's a risk that ultimately, you know, a government might come along, uh, our government, another government, and they might use that information to attempt to seize Bitcoin. They can't like press a button to take your Bitcoin, but they can threaten you with fines or jail time or something like that, put a gun to your head. 
and and try and try and take your Bitcoin that way. Um, so you need to be aware of that risk. I don't want to necessarily discourage people from going down that route. And this goes back to the, you know, perfection is like the enemy good enough as we were talking mm -hmm, about before mm -hmm. people get overwhelmed. Um, but you should at least be aware of the risk and you should be trying to at least have separate ways of accumulating Bitcoin that are not tied to your government issued identity. Now, what are those ways? Well, you can mine, you can earn. I think ultimately a lot of this risk with KYC goes away as the Bitcoin economy develops because, and that's why I'm very focused on trying to build this circular economy. It's another reason why the beef initiative is so cool where I don't think, you know, Soon enough, people won't be buying Bitcoin. They'll be earning Bitcoin. They won't be selling Bitcoin. They'll be spending Bitcoin. All of a sudden, you start to take away those centralized choke points. So you can mine, you can earn, um, you can trade person to person. So there's there's some platforms like Hoddle Hoddle, Bisc with a Q. Uh, there's one called RoboSats, mm. uh, which is relatively new, which is really good. There's a new one coming out that's going to be announced in a few weeks called Peach. Um, that is very, very promising. That's completely mobile focused. And in those, you're essentially, you're setting up an offer. You're saying how you're going to pay for it. You know, maybe it's a money order. Uh, maybe it's cash in person. Uh, some people will do bank wires and stuff, but at least you're not on. So there's still some surveillance in that aspect, but you're not on some massive honeypot list of Bitcoiners. Um, so th that's an option. Uh, another option is friends and friends and family that have Bitcoin. Like if if you're once again to all the Bitcoiners out there, if you're a Bitcoiner um, and you're basically 100% of Bitcoin and you you know you need some you need some fiat, like consider a friend or family new coiner that is looking for Bitcoin, right? And and do a deal with them. Um, so that's another option. And then last but definitely not least uh, is oh, and also on that note, what I do a lot is. Um, I will pay with cash for dinner and then I will have them pay me back Bitcoin, especially if I know that Bitcoiners are going to be, if I'm going to be around Bitcoiners, like that's where you can really, mm -hmm. you know, you're at the bar, you pay the bar tab and then you like send them a Bitcoin invoice afterwards. Right. And you, yeah. you get some Bitcoin that way. Um, so that's another way, but last but not least Bitcoin ATMs. Now Bitcoin ATMs, we call them ATMs. They basically should be considered vending machines. You put in cash and then Bitcoin gets sent to your phone. Um, those are everywhere now. Uh, a lot of them require a phone number. Uh, you can use a burner phone number if you want, you know, the best privacy. But even if you use your regular phone number, which is tied to your identity, it's basically a social security number at this point. People are like born into a phone number and they die with their phone number. Which, by the way, you probably shouldn't do, but a lot of people do that. Even if you give them your phone number, it's still infinitely better than uploading your passport, doing all this stuff. Um, you're giving them less information than if you do that. So consider Bitcoin ATMs. And I'm I'm sure most people listening here has seen at least one or two in their neighborhood. They're, they're absolutely yeah. everywhere now. Are you comfortable sharing what methods you personally use to accumulate your Bitcoin? Well, so in the past, it was, it was really easy to do without KYC. Um, in like 2016, like the first, the first, uh, first few exchanges started adding KYC. And within like two years, it just got it completely normalized. And anyone who wasn't doing it got crushed. Uh, by the feds, you know, like uh, there was a big one that was still running for a while called BitMEX. Um, they were based in the Seychelles, like they arrested the CEOs that like got them to add KYC. Like there's, uh, so it's gotten a lot more difficult. Uh, mining is a, is a, is a, is a relatively accessible way. Um, I have a show called Citadel Dispatch and I have three different episodes starting from beginner to, in to intermediate to advanced on home mining because you can still buy the miners without KYC and essentially at the very low, very high level, you plug that into internet and power and it just produces Bitcoin for you and sends it to your wallet. Um, and I earn a, a lot of my income is in Bitcoin. Um, so, you know, about maybe about like 70% of my income is coming in as, as Bitcoin to begin with. And then my rent is still in fiat. So that like last 30% kind of just goes to like immediate fiat expenses. Yeah. Uh, so I don't really, I, I, I'm, I'm in a unique situation where I, I don't really have that need. Um, but it, it depends on, it depends on everybody's individual situation and how they can best address that on a personal level. What, what trends do you see kind of developing? You said one that you noticed in the past was the increased amount of KYC. Is there anything else in, in the next few years that you see as particularly problematic trends maybe that might continue to bear their heads? It's privacy. 
Yeah. And so KYC falls in the same thing. And now we we saw we saw this just happen to Ethereum. Ethereum had uh, their their main privacy tool called Tornado Cash uh, got sanctioned. It got put on the sanction list, and they're going after the developers of it. Uh, they arrested one of the developers in the Netherlands. Um, they're blocking those transactions from interacting with these regulated services. Um, and I think in a lot of ways, like that could have happened on Bitcoin too. I think in a lot of ways, uh, as Bitcoiners, we were fortunate that that first shot of that war, like it wasn't the first shot. The first shot was really KYC, but that second big shot of the, of the privacy battle and financial privacy happened on Ethereum rather than Bitcoin. It gave us a little bit more time. Um, but I don't think people are really don't really appreciate the risk. And like the way I look at it is, is, is it's not a threat. Once again, it's not a threat to the Bitcoin network. The Bitcoin network is actually extremely robust, extremely state resistant, censorship resistant. It would take a lot of money and a lot of willpower to, to actually try and crush it. There would be necessary. There you pretty much need global cooperation among enemy states that will never cooperate with each other. Even the allies can barely cooperate with each other efficiently. Um, so I'm pretty confident that the Bitcoin network, as, as time goes on, I get more and more confident in the robustness of the Bitcoin network to the point where I am never been more bullish on that aspect. But I see a vulnerability of individuals. Mm -hmm. And I'm not like speaking from like... Uh, I'm I'm not like talking down to people because I'm vulnerable too. Like I'm on this podcast, which makes me even more vulnerable than people that are KYCing themselves, right? Yes. Um, but I think this movement is so important that I'm willing to do that. And I just also like life is short, and I was in like a dead end fiat job, and I just this is something that really matters, and I it's it's important to focus on it. But there's a reason why most. Big corners with an audience do not talk about privacy. And it's because it's already been almost inherently criminalized in our minds, even without laws that say it's a crime, because it's not a crime to, to want financial privacy. It's not a crime to use Bitcoin privacy tools or use Bitcoin in a private way. But in our heads, we've just been this idea as a society, and this goes back to this, you know, people trying to fathom Bitcoin. As a society, the idea of personal responsibility has been bred out of us. Mm. Like no one practices personal responsibility anymore, except for the ranchers and the activists. Yeah. So, so uh, as a result, people just have come to accept this idea of the financial panopticon. People have come to accept the idea that you know when they walk into their neighbor's house, there's an internet connected camera in it that goes straight to Amazon servers and sees every single person that goes in and out of the house, or they have a a wiretap on their kitchen counter that tells them the weather and does a cooking timer, you know, people have got to normalize to that. And to want out of that makes you feel like you're breaking the law or you're a criminal as a result. Right. And also like getting rid of Facebook, like, Oh, Oh, you're getting rid of, you're getting rid of your social media. Like, why are you a weirdo? Like what is going on there? And as a result, people don't talk about it. And the, the first sign of trouble is when people stop feeling comfortable about talking about it. So that's my, that's my single biggest concern. And it's why it's one of my single biggest focuses in the space. Mm. For someone that's listening to this episode and everything that you're saying is resonating with them, but they have some concern or fear that they missed the party or they missed the boat, whatever you want to say, what's your response to them? Every single person thinks they're late when they find Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. 2013, I thought I was late. I still think I was late. Uh, no, I don't still think I was late. Um, I think, I mean, even in 2013, there was posts from like 2011 of people saying like, oh, there's this famous post on Bitcoin talk, which was this forum where most people had conversation before Reddit and then before Twitter and then before like discord and all this other platforms we have now. Um, and there's a famous post from 2011 where he's complaining about like not buying it at two cents. And like now it's like 25 cents or something and how he missed the bus. Um, that's just going to keep on happening. And one of the things, one of the frameworks I like to work with is as long as, as long as the overwhelming majority of people are buying Bitcoin rather than earning Bitcoin, we're still early. Like right. it's, it's, we haven't, we haven't hit that point yet. And if you, if you want to do it empirically, there's like 8 billion people on earth. Maybe there's 50 million Bitcoiners, probably, probably, probably maybe a little bit less. Some people say a hundred million, but I don't count the people that are you know, just holding their, their coin on, on Robinhood or something like that. There's probably like 50 million, maybe a little bit less sovereign Bitcoiners that are actually holding their own keys 
uh, even way less that are that using their own node. So, so this is massively early days still. Um, and, and just don't get, uh, disillusioned by it, just slow and steady over time, you know, build up, build up a stack and save for your children. You mentioned, uh, you mentioned Silk Road before, which is, I think an interesting case of, you know, the government coming in and, and enacting some level of authority over this new technology. What's your, what's your take on what happened there? And maybe if you could provide some context, because I'm not an expert in it, but. Well, so I'm not. So, so Silk Road um, was a P2P marketplace. It was an online website that you could go to and you could trade goods uh, for Bitcoin. Um, now, a lot of those goods uh, were illegal in the places that people were buying them. Uh, that's why they were going out of their way to use Silk Road rather than going on Amazon or going to their store or something like that. Um they made a very big attempt to try and prevent uh, violent things. There was guns for sale on there for a little bit. They removed the guns. Um, they they didn't allow child porn, for instance. They they had like their own standards that they enforced. These like almost free market standards that they were enforcing. Um, obviously, that that didn't help. Uh, Ross, who was is the alleged, you know, creator and operator of Silk Road, um, basically got the book thrown at him and he was made an example out of, and there was a lot of corrupt policing happening there. Like I, I, I implore everyone listening to this to go, you know, look into Ross's case. It's absolutely tragic what they did to him. The guy's, you know, been serving jail ever since they, they took him in and he's facing many, many, many more years. Um, we actually did, I consult for Bitcoin magazine. We got his first uh, audio interview since he'd been in jail and we played it at our conference and and the the prison had given all approvals and stuff we went through all the processes and as soon as we pressed play at the conference they threw him into solitary confinement so it's very much a political um it's very much a, a political incarceration and 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 they're trying they tried to make an example out of him and i think they were very successful at it but it, it does show it it does show the power of bitcoin and it also to go back to the misconception idea it shows one of the key misconceptions of Bitcoin, which is, you know, when I first got into Bitcoin, I was like, oh, Silk Road, like the government's going to crush this thing. And they did crush it because it was run by a centralized party, but they didn't crush Bitcoin. They just crushed this marketplace that was on top of Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. And what happened? What happened was there's been, you know, hundreds of, of, of equivalent sites that have popped up right now. There's probably like three or four that are out there. Um, and every time one gets crushed, like five more pop up um, and the underlying Bitcoin network never gets taken down in that process. Right. So and, and they're all based in all different places in the world. And um, they all, you know, try and maintain their privacy so that they're they're not known once in a while, like one will get crushed and then another couple will pop up. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, I think one of the last last questions I had for you for someone that's listening to this um, that wants to go deeper down the rabbit hole and just beef up their educational knowledge on Bitcoin, what are the go-to materials that you recommend? So I have a specific episode of my podcast, Silo Dispatch, okay. episode 43. So if you search Silo Dispatch in your podcast app and go to episode 43, it's two hours from start to finish getting into Bitcoin for your first time holding your own keys, using your own Bitcoin node, just to tap in there, using your own, a, a Bitcoin node is required to use the Bitcoin network. Most people use someone else's Bitcoin node. If you use someone else's Bitcoin no node, you're trusting them with validating the rules of the network, the most famous one being 21 million Bitcoin, and you're trusting them with your privacy. So if you want to use Bitcoin in a properly sovereign way, ultimately you want to end up using your own node. So it goes through all the steps, but we talk about the threats of KYC, the different options you have available to you, um, and it's really just start to finish two hours. Uh, and I think we intentionally tried to make it as accessible as possible. So I would just say, start there. Okay. Obviously anyone listening to this enjoys podcasts, so it's a good fit. Sweet. I love it. But then I also have sealdispatch.com slash help. And it's like a list of all external resources. Uh, if, if you want to go even further down the rabbit hole. Perfect. Well, there, link are so, that there are so many great people out there. You included just putting that information so openly accessible for people. Akana is another great example. Um, but it's such an underserved part of the Bitcoin 
world this just like fundamentals like why you should give a shit about being a sovereign individual totally. message <laughs> Um, so we, we just really appreciate what you're doing and we're excited to connect out in Crawford. That was an awesome few days and it was, it was great just to be able to get to know each other a little bit better. No. Yeah. I mean, I appreciate you boys. Uh, you remind me a lot of me. I have a, I have a separate show called rabbit hole recap. Uh, my co-host Marty Bent, we've been doing that for four years. That's like a new show, a weekly new show. Yeah. Uh, doing it every week for four years. And you guys remind me of us. Love uh, it in the food space uh so there's there's or i feel like there's already a strong bond here and i have a feeling it's gonna get totally. even stronger and yeah. i'm sure you guys talk about it all the time on the podcast but uh slim is amazing beef initiative is amazing the georgia event is going to be absolutely amazing and i'm really sorry that i'm not going to make it but there's very few tickets left so if any of your listeners are considering going make sure you go to beefinitiative.com soon and grab a ticket totally dude we'll have to do something in nashville right yes let's do it yeah, so I mean, just real quick, I built, uh, I moved there in December and I just, I'm like a big, just, I say yes and lean into things. <laughs> and uh, there was like the beginnings of this like booming Bitcoin community. And we just, we've done meetups every month. And now we're getting like 200, 250 people every month, uh, people that are just very like-minded and ideologically driven. And uh, like two year, two months ago, we started to outgrow the space we were meeting at. We were meeting at uh, this local brewery um, and we were, we were too many people for that space. And we found this fantastic, I'm calling it a campus. It's these two buildings next to each other, two stories each has studios, event space, co-working space, has a little coffee shop um, and has a courtyard in between. So we're calling it Bitcoin park. Right. Uh, and so we're doing all of these community grassroots initiatives there, including launching the Tennessee Beef Initiative out of it. Nice. Yeah. So I would love to host both of you guys there sometime. It'd be, it'd be a lot of fun. Let's do it. That'd be sweet. Also, Nashville's a great time. We, we, uh, I drove through Nashville on my road trip, my final road trip down to Austin when I was moving here and uh, hung out with a buddy. And I, I just love that city, love Tennessee in general. So really good vibes. It happen. Yeah. Great vibes, but Odell, this has been amazing, man. Thank you so much for doing this. We're uh, we're really grateful to have you as a friend now, and can't wait to see you again in person, brother. Likewise.